How's it going, Mr. Businessman? I can't complain. How are you? So how many people did you exploit today? I didn't exploit anyone. Oh really? How many people work for you? A lot of people work for me. And what do they earn? Most of them earn minimum wage, but many of them earn more than that. My salary is the highest. Well, that's all well and good for you, but how can you support a system that allows people to be exploited like that? What system? Capitalism. What exactly do you think capitalism is? Capitalism is private ownership of the means of production. Capitalist governments support companies' rights to pay their workers next to nothing, so that the CEOs can extract as much profit as possible from them, and pay themselves exorbitant salaries and bonuses. That is why I'm an anarchist and not a capitalist. I believe that people should earn the full product of their labor. I also believe that people should earn the full product of their labor. I find that hard to believe. Why is that? Because, as a capitalist, you depend on government to defend your right to pay people next to nothing. I feel that I pay my employees reasonably well. And I don't depend on government to defend my right to do that. But let me ask you something. Is any person an anarchist who rejects the use of force? No. You see, hierarchy makes it possible for business executives to exploit workers, to use them, to take advantage of them. If you reject force but don't reject hierarchy, you are not truly an anarchist. That's why phrases like free market anarchism and anarcho-capitalism are oxymorons. But words like use, exploit, advantage, these are just innocuous words. They have been given bad connotations. They have been given bad connotations because of capitalism. It is impossible for economic transactions to happen under capitalism without someone gaining and someone else losing. If that were true, we wouldn't be talking to each other right now. This conversation isn't an economic transaction. Not exactly, but it is a sort of exchange. Each of us is choosing to talk instead of go out and buy a loaf of bread, or work at a cash register, or work behind a desk, or talk to someone who we already know agrees with us. We have decided to forgo our next most preferable alternatives because we think there might be some reward in learning about one another's views. But what about buying a loaf of bread? Every customer knows that he is paying more for the bread than it costs the store to buy it. It is the customer's decision to pay that price. Before the integration of commerce became as intensified as it is today, and before the modern UPC code system became commonplace, customers had the ability to haggle. The customer could negotiate face to face with the person who wanted to sell the bread. The main idea is that you want the bread more than you want to keep your money, and the seller wants your money more than he wants to keep his bread. It's called subjective value. Sounds kind of existentialist. It is. But subjective value can also be applied to labor negotiation. Let me ask you something. In your ideal society, how is the full product of someone's labor determined? The full product of labor is equal to the value of the goods that that labor produces. What is a nuclear bomb worth? Excuse me? Well, it takes a lot of labor to produce a nuclear bomb. Is a nuclear bomb therefore very valuable? No, nuclear bombs are terrible. They cause widespread destruction and loss of life. So you have a problem with nuclear bombs because of the costs that their use afflicts on humanity and its infrastructure? Yes. So you don't believe that something has value simply due to the labor which was required to produce it? I guess not. So then you would agree that the value of a product is equal to the value of the labor required to produce and use it minus the costs of its production and use? Yes. So then, do you think it is appropriate to make a cost-benefit analysis when producing a good? Yes. Okay. Where do you work? I work at the Cheesecake Factory. My boss is a total fascist. You may just be right about that. When you interviewed for the job, did you have the right to negotiate your own wage? Yes. Okay. No. What? I'm entry level. Every entry level employee at the Cheesecake Factory works for minimum wage. The minimum wage is barely enough for rent and groceries. I resent that I had to compete with other people to get my job. But you did it anyway. Yes, but I have to provide for myself. And you decided to compete with others because you are self-interested. That's not a very nice thing to say. 
I'm not selfish. I'm just trying to provide for myself and my family. And that's a very noble reason to get a job. But I'm not saying you're selfish. I'm saying you're self-interested. What do you mean? I mean that you knew that your boss was offering minimum wage, and you weighed the benefits of your compensation against the costs of exerting your labor. You made the decision that what your boss was offering was acceptable to you. Well, yes. But you see, the capitalist system imposes competition for jobs. I do not have a high level of skill, so I cannot compete against others easily. As a result, I have to submit to a system that devalues my labor. Nobody forced you to submit to that system. And besides, competition isn't something that can be imposed. But I feel like I was forced. You see, feudal lords evicted tenant serfs from their land, and they fled to the cities, where they had to compete in order to sell their labor. The serfs were robbed of their land, and the poverty and competition for jobs which resulted from those evictions conditioned the development of the economy up to the present day. So you resent the serfs being robbed of their property? No, I don't believe in property. What I want is for workers to be able to access and use the means of production. That's not the same as property. But you use and access your employer's means of production every day. That may be so, but I still don't receive the product of the labor I expend when I use those means of production. Would you agree that individuals should have the right to determine what the product of their labor is? Yes. So do I. I don't understand. Well, do you support the right of an individual to determine what the full product of their labor is even if it, the value of that product is below the minimum wage? No. Like I said, the minimum wage is not even a decent wage. I'd hate to see people earn less than that. But some people are even less skilled than you are. Would you rather see such a person not be able to even get a job than let them struggle to get by? How could you suggest that I would want that to happen? Well, you haven't indicated otherwise. So what's your point? My point is that minimum wage laws force employers to discriminate against the low-skilled people because of the low value of their labor. This causes unemployment. Well then, the government should do more to create jobs. Government? I thought you said you were an anarchist. I am an anarchist. What I meant to say was that the people should create jobs. It would be impossible to create jobs out of nowhere without making a lot of them low quality, or low paying, or by reducing the quality and pay of the jobs held by everybody else in the economy. This is because there is a shortage of employment opportunities. That's what I'm saying, there aren't enough jobs. Right, but if you try to create jobs without a solid basis for the creation of wealth, and without a real need for more labor, you have to take wealth from somebody. But you said that it's not true that, in an economic exchange, someone always gains and someone else loses. It's true when the system is rigged to work that way. But I have the right to have a job and to earn a living. But at whose expense does that right come? What? You have the right to earn a living if someone agrees to give you that right. But you don't have the right to earn a living at someone else's expense. You have the right to defend yourself if someone tries to harm you, and the threat of that harm is immediate, clear, and present. But if I didn't earn a living, I would starve to death. Yes, but how pressing would the threat of starvation be? You would always be free to ask people to help you, as long as you didn't threaten them. I don't think there are enough people with enough money to help all those in need. That's what social welfare programs like food stamps, unemployment, and Medicaid are for. Those programs condition people to depend on politicians to force citizens to behave morally and charitably. If we didn't have social welfare, or if it were more localized, efficient, and financially solvent, the tax burden would be lifted from the people, and it would be easier for them to afford to help others. What were you saying earlier about jobs? Why did you use the word shortage? I was talking about how both socialism and capitalism only become necessary under conditions of scarcity. You can't distribute a scarce resource like employment without affecting the pay, benefits, and conditions of people who already have jobs. So are you like a member of the Tea Party or something? Not exactly. I think the Tea Party has some legitimate concerns. But so does the Occupy Wall Street movement. How could you sympathize with both movements? They're total opposites. What do you think about Occupy Wall Street? I think it's great. 
I am against corporate greed, and I want big business to stop controlling my government. I think the top 1% needs to be taxed more. Your government? Anyway. You want the government and big business to be separate, right? Yes. Then why do you dislike the Tea Party? Because the Tea Party doesn't want big businesses to pay their fair share of taxes to the government. Okay, I'm just going to pretend you don't keep using government to support most of your arguments. You're right, I keep getting off track. What I mean to say is that big businesses and corporations take up too big a share of the economy. I agree. Really? Yes. I think we lose our economic freedom and our social and political freedom when the government tells businesses what to do, and when businesses tell the government what to do. Well, I agree that businesses shouldn't control the government, because that's fascism. But I think government should be able to regulate business. I agree, but I think we would define government and regulation differently. Are you religious? Why do you ask? Well, if you were religious, you wouldn't want the government telling you what to believe, just like you wouldn't want to use the government to force your beliefs on other people. Yes, I believe in the separation of church and state. Well, I believe in the separation of business and state. If you expect corporations to stop influencing elections and affecting policy, then you should stop giving them a reason to do so by letting government tell them how to do business. But corporations wouldn't exist if it weren't for the government. They would. But monopolies wouldn't exist. How do you figure? Monopolies are the inevitable result of competition in a free market. Governments don't support free markets, and monopolies don't result from competition. Competition is antithetical to monopoly. Lobbyists for big businesses and corporations and representatives in government get together and write laws that favor both. Any monopoly you see is perpetuated through either force or the threat of force. No, go on. Monarchs controlled the economy under feudalism. Communists didn't have a problem with the control itself. What they resented was that they themselves didn't have any control. They were jealous. Communist revolution is not anarchist for that reason, and also because it is violently imposed on people who do not consent to it whether they are rich lords or different types of socialists. Anarchy should be as peaceful as possible, and force should only be used in self-defense. The communist revolution is self-defense, because people's lives come under threat when they are forced to work for low wages and they can't afford to eat adequately. It seems like you and I define force differently. I mean, you weren't literally forced to accept minimum wage, as in with a gun to your head. You wouldn't have killed your boss if he had refused to hire you, would you? Of course not. But I joined the union, and if my boss threatens to cut my wages, benefits, or conditions, my union will confront him in large numbers, force him to negotiate with us, encourage people to boycott the restaurant, and, if necessary, engage in a general strike. Force him to negotiate? Not violently, of course. It would be violent, actually. You're using the word force correctly this time. Businesses are required by law to negotiate with the unions on their employees. You are giving the government the right to commit violence on your behalf. But no such right exists, because the right to be free from violence is the right from which all other legitimate rights are derived. But how else can I get my boss to negotiate with my union? Every other way you mentioned. Boycotts, strikes, protests confront him in large numbers, alert potential customers that he is treating you unfairly. If you work hard enough to spread information, you will succeed without having to resort to violence. And besides, if you fail, you can always quit and work somewhere else. That actually sounds pretty reasonable. How would you feel if someone at the Cheesecake Factory started another union? I would be fine with that. What if its members were willing to tolerate lower wages, fewer benefits, poorer conditions, less frequent negotiation rights, or all of the above? Well, that would be pretty stupid on their part. But they can do that if they think it's in their best interest. But it would probably cause the members of your union to get fired. Oh, I get it. So until there is another union, my union is like a monopoly. Exactly. While big businesses get favors from government, they can unfairly compete against small and local businesses, 
Well-established unions hate dual unionism because they know that the union that tolerates the worst conditions has an edge in currying the favor of the employer and the government. So the well-established union competes by giving away all the benefits its members negotiated for in the name of getting something done and staying ahead. Governments and unions have an interest in working together because the more money a worker earns, the more money government can take from him in taxes, and the more money the union can take from him in dues payments. Right. But how do Americans who don't want underskilled Mexicans taking their jobs expect to stay employed without taking a pay cut? Guns. It's always the damn guns. Pretty much. It was nice talking to you. You're a good listener. Thanks. I'm sorry I treated you so rudely. I guess I shouldn't hate someone simply because of how much money they have. You know what? You earn more money than five out of six people on the planet. Really? Wow. I just feel so fortunate to be able to help my family. I guess I wouldn't even be able to take care of them if we redistributed the world's wealth equally. I'd give you some money to help your family, but my company is being fined for setting prices too high, setting prices too low, and charging the same price as everybody else. That sucks. That sucks for both of us. And for my family. Napoleon once said that religion is what stops the poor from murdering the rich. Really? I guess that explains why Karl Marx hated religion so much. 